write down one time. 403. All right, um, I'm here, Heather Raymond. Uh, we also have Miss Lampier, and we have Mr. Posca, which is just enough. So, um, so a couple of things that we wanted to talk about today. One is um, kind of our new, how we're going to handle policies going forward, um, which I didn't make its own number on the agenda. And then also we have two new policies. And so I am comfortable having the conversation in either order. Does anyone have any preferences? Okay, so let's just jump into the two we have and then we can talk about how we're going to manage policies now that we're actually following the policy that we approved back in September okay. about how policies should be approved. All right, so this month we have um, two required updates. Um, the first one is EBCB fire safety. Um, and so this is one that we update, I don't want to say every year or every other year. Um, generally, the um, fire marshal has updates based on changes in fire codes and ordinances and best practices. Um, and he gives them to Chris Lassard, our head of, what is he, head of security? Yes. Okay, our director of security. Um, and then he brings them to us. Um, so the big changes this year um, are on page two. Um, and they're regarding updating um, the standards um, for upholstery and textiles. Um, so it used to be uh, the code was NFPA 701. Now there's a new code, NFPA 260, for classifying materials that are potentially flammable. Um, and I don't understand any of that, but if you have the information, I would love it, Mr. Posca. I do. Thank you, Ms. Raymond. Uh, Mr. Lasada was going to attend, but uh, he, and he sends his regrets, but he's not feeling well today. Uh, but kind of to summarize the, the changes that are coming forward, um, the National Fire Rescue used to allow curtains to be treated with a flame retardant um, substance by a professional. When an article is treated, it's good for five years before it needs to be treated again. Uh, the problem with that, it was very difficult to track that process with the different uh, items that were going through that um, process. As a result, um, uh, National Fire Rescue informed uh, Mr. Lasad they would not be accepted treating fabrics uh, curtains going forward. So the policy was changed to reflect that treatment is no longer an accepted method. And that's what we're seeing in the, um, uh, in the policy. So going forward, any fabric or curtain purchase needs to be made with the flame retardant material, which does not have a shelf life. Any fabric that was previously treated will be grandfathered in until the expiration of the treatment. You'll be, and they'll know when the expiration of the treatment is? Yes, and I think that's why it just became really cumbersome to go through all the 17, 18, 19 buildings that we may have, what had been treated, what hadn't, so they just... Uh, there was a decision to me to kind of refer back to, let's just look at the tag. What does the tag say? Okay. Sounds good. Right. So this means that once we approve this um, change, which I think we should because fire safety is critical for our kids, um, there are not a lot of curtains in our schools, um, but people will have to look in their own classrooms at the tags um, and um, replace or remove any curtains that... Um, don't meet that don't say, you know, non flammable or fire treated or whatever. Um, the do we know what month the fire marshal usually comes in? Is it all of them in one month or does he have like a rotating? I know that they inspect all of the schools. There's an inspection, I think they rotate through all the schools um, in, in chunks. So trying to get through them, you know, usually in the, in the beginning of the year, first half of the year. Okay. So when the fire marshal goes through, if they know anything. I mean, it's our responsibility to make sure that it's fixed. Okay. Um, do you guys have any idea how much, um, like, it, they mentioned, like, beanbag chairs and stuff in here? Um, yep. Do you know how much furniture is going to be affected in the, I mean? So the furniture that we've been purchasing, um, like, on the middle school project, is fire, is appropriately fire rated. It comes that way from the manufacturer. Okay. So that stuff is good. This is mostly stuff that um, a teacher might get on their own or through donors choose and bring in. Um, but for the most part, our teachers are really good about 
looking at those things before they purchase their extra materials. Okay. Could things slip through, you know, that they've had for a long time? I don't know, maybe. Okay. I have another question about the, um, the sprinklers. Because um, it said that um, there's different standards for what you hang on the wall, according to whether or not the building has buildings have sprinklers throughout. And I was wondering what the percentage of buildings are that have sprinklers throughout and don't. And if that's something that will be changed over, you know, as we go on. I don't know specifically. I mean, I have to assume there are sprinklers obviously in all our buildings. I'm not quite sure. Uh, exactly what sprinklers you're talking about or where they are. I think that would probably be a more specific question for Mr. Lassad to answer. Okay. But I don't know. I'm, I'm not doing a good job answering your question, A. But B, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Was, well, so I just assumed that there were sprinklers in all the buildings, which I'm sure they are. But um, the um, it says... Artwork can be on 50% of the walls in buildings where the sprinklers are throughout. And then it can only be on 20% of the walls otherwise. So it made me wonder, I figured they wouldn't put this, this stipulation in unless there were some buildings that did not have sprinklers throughout. And I wasn't sure exactly what that meant. I think, in essence, I think the fire department is trying to, to promote safety and try to limit the amount of items that are hang or hang on being posted to the wall or sometimes you might see kind of like a you know a wire or a piece of when things hang from rope you know although although decorative they are also fire starters in in the if something ever went happen so they want to limit the amount of things so, you know I, sometimes there you know you have, might have a teacher who really wants to promote a lot of the you know, student work in the classroom and there are things presented all over the place i mean it looks great but probably not aligned with the fire department regulations. Okay. I remember back in 2019, I think when we updated it in 2019, there were some big, big changes about um, like the types of cords you could use and extension cords. And it was, it actually required quite a bit of effort from our, our staff to go through and we had to replace a bunch of cords and we paid to rewire some of the, the classrooms and some of the buildings because they're there just wasn't enough electrical outlets yeah. within the space that they needed to use some of their projectors and, and such that just was technology that didn't exist back when the buildings were built. Um, this change hopefully won't cause such a big headache. Um, but I did write down on the sheet for Miss um, Kinsella, and I said, can Chris Lassard tell us which buildings don't have sprinklers throughout, just so we... Okay, cool. Thank you. We can know, and then if any teachers are watching, they can know whether they... I do know that when the fire marshal walks through, because I happened to be at a school when he did it once, he does tell people like this, you know, this isn't going to work or that's not going to work or um, so, and then they react appropriately. But it, right. I think it's pretty rare for us yeah. to have a problem. And again, if, if they are, it's, it's, I think the problems are easily addressed. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to move to send, uh, E, B, C, D to the full board. Uh, second. Wait, as presented here. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Two, <coughs> two not three. Okay, great. Um, any other questions you want him to follow up with? No, I'm not. That would be my only two questions. I also remember, this is just sparking a memory. A few years ago, I don't, I don't know, Mr. Pasca, if you were here then, there was a problem in Penichuk where the sprinklers, something happened with the sprinklers and they started going off. Oh, my. Wow. In, um, in a couple of science classrooms and something else. And the whole system had to like be reset and we ended up replacing the whole system as part of the Penichuk renovation project. Jeez. Because we were like, we never want to experience this again. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, I don't remember what year that was. But. I think it may have been last year. Yeah, maybe. Um, okay, so the other policy we have on for tonight is instructional materials IJ. Um, this policy is regarding um, how um, 
instructional material, like it just basically says that um, the board is responsible for approving instructional materials. It looks like we're making a lot of changes here, but we're not. Um, this is one where, uh, as part of our um, agreement with the Department of Justice, um, part of what they did with their investigation was review our policies, and they asked for some of our policies to be more inclusive um, and to specifically reference um, our English language learner students. Um, and so um, they were fine with the majority of this policy, um, but it didn't say anything specific about English language learners. Um, and so what we've done is we've updated this um, based on um, the ED 306s. Um, we've updated it using the guidance from the attorneys at the School Boards Association and also the guidance from the attorneys at the Department of Justice. Okay. So the biggest major change here um, is two things. One um, is on page... On two, on page two, number six, it says take into consideration the needs of English language learners. Uh, it should say English language learner and then students, not learners, students, because that sounds funny. Um, and then um, it talks about um, depict an accurate and unbiased uh, way the cultural diversity and plural, pluralistic nature of American society because we need to be inclusive of all of our students who are here. Um, we're keeping everything about um, how materials are selected to be developmentally and age appropriate, that they provide quality um, learning experience, that they fit within the district's educational goals and philosophies. All of that is the same. Um, we talk a lot about um, um, you know, the second part of the, the thing is about, um, about um, providing instructional resources, um, you know, that provide um, information efficiently and effectively, critically, competently. We talk about, you know, not plagiarizing things, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the last area of the policy um, asks that, oh, and it says that we would like to make sure that our staff are reviewing our um, instructional course material every five years or so. So we don't end up in a situation where we're using textbooks from the late 90s, um, which this district has had. Okay. Um, at a budget committee meeting, it was in COVID, we discovered that some of our textbooks were, you know, 20 years old, Ooh, right? So we're trying to fix all of that. Um, the last part of it that we do need to talk about at this meeting, though, says instructional resources plan, which was not part of the um, policy before. Um, and this basically says the superintendent is directed to prepare, maintain, and implement a written plan for the ongoing development, organization, acquisition, maintenance, replacement, and updating of instructional resources necessary to support the needs of the user population and approved curriculum. The plan shall conform to all applicable uh, New Hampshire Department of Education uh, requirements and should be presented to the school board every, and then we have three question mark years for periodic review. This is one of the things that the DOJ has also asked us to look at is is really focusing on our curriculum needs and yeah. making sure that we have a plan for curriculum and then how to support our staff in using that curriculum. I like that. I mean, the fact that the, just, the superintendent is preparing it and maintaining it, it means that it's going to be a whole vision rather than just piecemeal. I like that a lot. And I think that it needs to be presented to the school board because it has to be approved. I don't know that three years is an appropriate number for our district at the current time. I know that we're asking for materials to be reviewed every five years. Five might make a little bit more sense for consistency's sake, and then, you know, we can do it more frequently. But I want to make sure that we are um, that we are um, engaging fully uh, with the spirit of what the Department of Justice has asked us to do. You know how much work it would be for us to, for them, for the curriculum to, 
curriculum to be presented? Would it be like multiple meetings or, because I kind of thought maybe if it was presented every two years, then every person elected to the board would get a chance to review it. Whereas if it's more than that, where our terms are staggered, it might not be able to be seen by many. That's a good question. I know that for the high schools, any changes to the course catalog are presented on an annual basis to the board through the curriculum committee. But I don't, I don't remember ever seeing like a comprehensive catalog of courses for the middle school um, or curriculum. And then for the elementary school, it's kind of in piecemeal, right? Like we, we had a, let's try CKLA, let's try this, and the board approves it. This is to try and alter the way that we do business so that we yeah. have a, a plan. I, I am not a curriculum expert. I don't know how much work we're asking for here. It sounds like a lot to me. It is an awful lot of work, and I think it's important that we keep our curriculum fresh and updated with best practices. But I think to the point of, of some of the other work that has to be done is identifying where our curriculum needs are so we can plan appropriately uh, and also budget appropriately to identify the needs going forward. So we try to have kind of a, a rolling process of what is in the queue, what's the priority at this time so we can fit those needs. And I think that's something Dr. Andre has, has talked about uh, going forward is trying to, particularly at the, you know, I think to, to Ms. Raymond's point, we've piecemealed some things um, probably um, better at the elementary level. Uh, and I think going forward, particularly the secondary level, uh, we need to identify what those needs are. Uh, and then I, and, and the, once we identify those, and I think we heard some of these things the other day when we we're talking about curriculum, you know, that can drive our vision and then our, our budgetary resources as well of what's coming forward. So I think to the point, you know, we're talking about right now, and I think we heard a message the other night, it all really does come together. And I think it's important that we are, rather than kind of living in silos, kind of break down those silos and make ourselves aware of all these needs going forward. The other thing I, I would like to say is I like the idea of all of the school board members having the exposure and understanding what the curriculum is. I think that that's important. I think it's important for the public, too, to have that, like, to know that they can watch a meeting and find out what kids are learning and what the curriculum is and really have, you know, in-depth conversations about it. Um, but I want to make sure that we aren't putting ourselves in a situation where, um, we're setting up our teachers to have to learn new curriculum every two years or every three years. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I feel like one of the one of the themes that has come out of the Department of Justice review is is that um, our teachers feel overwhelmed and you know, like we're throwing too many things and not following up enough. Mm -hmm. And so I would hope that whatever plan the superintendent comes up with really involves, you know, that teacher feedback of. This is what we're seeing. This is what's working. This is what's not working. This is the support we need. I mean, well, I feel, I, you know, I'm not sure who suggested the three years. Was that the Department of Justice or? I think that came from the School Boards Association. School Board Association. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. And then if, um, you know, if we decide to change it down the road, we can, right? Yeah. I mean, um, I think that if we send it forward with three, um, it also just puts the bug in Dr. Andre's ear that if he feels that that's an unrealistic goal, if he thinks two is better, or if he thinks four, or whatever he thinks, he can give us that feedback uh, at the full board meeting. Um, do we know when we would get this presented to us the first time? Would it be three years from now, or would it be? I don't know how long it takes to put something like this together, <laughs> but it sounds like that the Department of Ed, Department of Justice would also like to see something like this. I think so. Certainly, I think this is something we have to embark upon now. And, and start in start the elementary level and move forward because that's a little further ahead than maybe some of the other levels. And then, what does middle school look like? What does high school look like? Uh, but I certainly know that you know coming up, you know, we we are going to have to have some conversations regarding you know textbooks, but it's more curriculum adoption going forward in, in, in online versions because we do have some content areas that you know are are due for for our, our need some updates and I think that's really the if we're, if we're doing X 
for FY25, and that's a big ticket item. What are we doing in FY26? It'll probably be another uh, big ticket item and try to kind of have some type of rolling patent so we can kind of build into the budget going forward so we know what our needs are. And I, I think that question about when we could see like the first, the first plan that we're now telling the superintendent he has to do um, is a good question to ask him at the meeting. Okay. Um, and it kind of rolls into the other conversation about how are we, um, now that we have a full and complete understanding of what first reading and second reading means, like how like that's something that we can maybe talk about at a first reading and um, see also what, you know, what do the teachers feel about that and what does the community feel about okay. you know, yeah, that having sense. a plan like that and who's involved in making that kind of plan because I don't know. I mean, the superintendent's responsible for everything, but I, I assume it's not just him sitting at his desk writing it by himself, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's good. I actually like the idea. That's that's one of the pluses of the first reading. I think. Um, so um, so before we go on to the next um, thing, or that or you make the motion, I just noticed that like in the in the write up here, it says that the board approves instructional resources, um, but everywhere else it says materials. I didn't know if that is an issue. If resources and materials would be considered the same thing, or if it's a different category, or hmm, that's a good question. So, in let's see, basic instructional material, instructional materials, instructional material, and then it says instructional resources maintained by the district shall be cataloged and classified. I guess my interpretation of that would be, you know, if we're using Amplify Science is our foundational instructional tool for science, elementary and middle school, okay? But if we're also using maybe uh, uh, National Geographic to support one of the activities or some of that, that would more be a resource that we're using to support Amplify. So we need to kind of document somewhere that, you know, these are the resources we're using to, to, to support our, our foundational tool. Should we, should we have it so that throughout we use resources and materials or materials and resources? I don't know. I didn't really even know if it made a difference. That's why, you know, I want to ask and make sure. Because I think that the resources is the, is the word that is used in Ed 306.08, which governs what resources are, like what the minimum standards are for resources. Um, but in general, you know, we frequently talk about like materials because I, I don't know if that's a throwback or not. I hadn't really noticed it until Ms. Lanfear brought it up. Me neither. I'm so glad you brought it up, though, because. But under the plan, it says, the plan shall development, our organization, acquisition, blah, 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 and updating of instructional resources necessary to support the needs of the user population and the approved curriculum. Like to me, I guess curriculum is the materials and the resources are the things we use to supplement. I mean, well, I know like, I know. like, I don't think the board should be approving like the books in ELA or whatever. That seems like micromanaging. Right, I agree. They should have some freedom there. Um, so I, I just wasn't sure. This is from reading the Department of Justice stuff the other day, and and they had everything like defined and everything. So I just wanted to make sure that it was it was okay the way it's written. Uh, I mean, I think overall, I think the, it, it, the, how this is written it, it is okay. Yeah. You know, I think one of the you know you know when when we talked about this, you know, and I want to thank Mr. Chopra for bringing this to our attention. I think we wanted to be just very cognizant of the needs of our English language learners when we are choosing those foundational, you know, materials going forward, you know, an Amplify, which we heard very good things about the other day. That's the big piece in how we, you know, how can that support all of our learners, not just our ELL learners. And I think, again, 
Yeah, I mean, the policy is really about um, selection of materials that meets the needs of all of our students. It's not about trying to um, say that certain materials aren't appropriate. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's about saying these are the ones that are. Um, I don't have, I, I don't know what we should do for materials. If Something um, that makes you feel comfortable. <laughs> I mean, if, if, See, I, I'm just bringing it up because I wanted to know what you guys thought. And if, since you guys together, you guys together feel comfortable with it, then I'm I'm comfortable with it too. You know, I I um I just wanted to get your opinions. So yeah, I'm fine with it the way it is. Okay. Um, do you think that we'll have any other? So I, it's unfortunate that we don't have more people here. Um, because I'm just curious about if we think we'll have any other um, issues that will come up at the full board regarding the policy. I know that we uh, we try really hard not to be political and to be a kind of above politics, but um, there are 300 bills coming to the State House regarding education, and many of them address materials. And I don't see that, that the wording of this policy in any way violates any of the proposed restrictions that are coming in. No, I didn't see. I didn't see anything to be concerned about. Too, I looked to see the language because I know that some. It's really easy sometimes for, um, you know, people to see divisiveness when there really isn't. There really isn't an intention to be divisive, um, and I didn't. I didn't see any reason for concern. Okay. All right. Good. Um. All right. Can we just um, follow up with Dr. Andre about resources versus materials and see if he has any um, expertise um, that we haven't thought of regarding that? So if he has a if he has a particular um, leaning one way or the other, I'm I think it's a. I certainly will bring that back, and I think maybe if he if we feel comfortable about moving this forward to the full board, it could be kind of a discussion during the first reading. Yeah, okay, that sounds good. And I don't, I guess for me, it's such a small change. It's not something that would, that to necessarily hold the policy back for another couple of months. No, no, I don't think so either. Okay. Um, but I, I think it's more important to get the EL, the e, English language language into in it. In there. Yeah. Yep. And really, I mean, I think it, it really beefs up the policy um, to the place where the Department of Justice will hopefully um, be more comfortable with it. And then, and then that will drive our service delivery in a way that is more appropriate for more students, yeah. so, which is always good. Okay, so um, with the knowledge that if Dr. Andre um, or Mr. Chopa have a very strong feeling um, based on their experience about resources versus materials, um, that we are open to making those minor adjustments at the full board. <laughs> I'm going to move that we send it to the full board. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Woo. Okay. So the other thing I just wanted to discuss, and again, I wish we had more people here, but we can discuss it amongst ourselves, <laughs> is um, the... Um, new practice that we're adopting of a first reading and a second reading um, and kind of what what should that look like um, the idea is to give the public the maximum opportunity to be aware of and respond to and provide their input to us um, which i think is good and important um, whether or not we have robust discussion about policies at every board meeting amongst the board members? I guess it depends on how the board, how the board members feel. Right? Like, yeah. I don't have an opinion one way or the other um, if we ought to create some rules for ourselves about, like, during the first reading, we just listen, we don't discuss. But I almost feel like if there's enough issues at the first reading, maybe that's an opportunity to send it back to policy for some changes and then come forward again. If, if, if something was sent back to policy and changes were made, it would have to come back for a first reading again, right? So it would be a couple months before it. Okay. 
Um, and so Mr. Posca and I were talking about how we should handle um, the like policy meeting, committee meetings going forward, and then also how to handle policies at the full board. Um, my thoughts are that we, um, at the full board, like this month, um, when we get our agenda for next week, policy would say policy, and then it would say second reading, and we would do the ones that we, the one, the middle school leveling policy that we've already had the first reading of. Now we have whatever other public comments we have, and then we have our board discussion and we vote. Okay. And then it would say second reading, and these two policies would go on. And then if the board had questions, comments, questions, comments from the public, we could do that, but not have a vote on them. Okay. And then have that be kind of our standard going forward. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, would that be a time when, um, if I had any, like the question about the resource and material, would that be the time when we could, like us as policy committee members, could ask Dr. Andre? At, okay. I think so, yes. Um, the other piece, excuse me, uh, we talked about, you know, the, the policy committee continuing to kind of do the work prior to to bring it forward about this to kind of do, you know, demonstrate some of the work that had been done. So this would be a really good example of we've done some work where there's a question regarding resources versus materials. We get some feedback that means, you know, we can still make that adjustments or to the point that you made, if there is significant more uh, amount of other work that's to be done, maybe it's sent back okay. to the committee to, to continue to work on. I know that there was some suggestion at our last full board meeting about having the first reading be prior to the policy committee meeting. I didn't like that idea. Okay. So I, I thought about it. I was like, well, that kind of makes sense. That introduces, but I wanted to, if we had done that with, for example, this policy IJ, what we would have sent forward would be the old one, which the Department of Justice said was insufficient. So I don't particularly think it would be helpful to get feedback from people on something that we weren't planning to move forward with because we knew it was insufficient, right? Yeah. So my feeling is we do the, the background work, the, we do work here and we send it to a first reading, even if that means it takes a little bit longer to get to the second reading. I mean, that's what the other committees do, the curriculum. I mean, they listen and they they give their opinions and they talk about it and vote it forward. And I think that's the same way that policy should be. Um, the other thing that Mr. Prosca and I were thinking that this change will happen if we're doing a first reading and a second reading, we can't do eight or 10 policies every month. Right. That would make you know, 16 to 20, <laughs> we would just be here for like three hours of policy on every full board meeting. Yeah. So we're going to try and limit our policy committees to less than five. Okay. Um, unless there's something that comes up. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, that's a little bit unfortunate because we have been able to get a lot done. But, you know, I guess it's in the interest of um, having the public and the rest of the board more involved. It's probably the best thing to do. Right. I mean, I... I don't like slowing things down either, except that I think that one of the things we learned through um, some of the other, some of the controversial policies that come up is that without doing a first reading and a second reading, we find out kind of after we've already approved something that people are unhappy. And I would much rather find out before we approve something that people are unhappy so we can be responsive to that. Yes. Um, but I still think that the vast majority of our policies, um, I mean, policy can be boring. You know, it's dry and technical and, you know, I think, I don't think a lot of people are going to come with comments on fire safety because we all agree that fire safety is important. There's, you know, yeah. there's nothing fascinating. Well, maybe it's fascinating for some people. There's nothing for a robust discussion about whether or not we should have curtains, curtains that are <laughs> fire rated, right? <laughs> I don't see a lot of people coming with like, you know, their signs about wanting flammable curtains. <laughs> so, um, so there's that. So one of the... Um, training. So I go to a lot of trainings because I like trainings and a lot of time they're at lunchtime and it's convenient for me to eat my lunch and learn stuff. Um, so one of the, the trainings that I went to recently about policies were two. I did one on legal updates and the other one was on policy management and process um, and how to do 
an audit of your policies. Um, and one of the things that came out of that training is that what, what they suggested that we do is that we establish a, a process in our policy committee where we really sit down and look at almost the whole year at once for policies, instead of going month by month like we have been doing. And then we pick a month where there are some policies that come up every month, every year. Like fire safety comes up a lot. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of some others. Yeah. There are some policies that it seems like there's a legal update to them every year. So um, the idea is to um, sit down and try and identify what policies we see frequently and then designate like, we're going to do those every June or, you know, especially if they're kind of boring, not controversial policies and try and put some of those in the summertime where people are less likely to be fully engaged and then do some of the more critical hard hitting ones during the year when we know that. Um, and then also to leave space for things that come up. So try and pick two policies a month that are do for review because they're over four years old, and then maybe one or two a month that the district needs because of timeliness issues. It sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it sounds like front loading it a lot, and I don't know how I feel about it. I mean, it also, you know, if the policy committee changes, then, um, you know, who's going to be the one that starts off with? I mean, there's not. I know. It just seems like I, I like the way we've been doing it. I... So those are just some thoughts moving forward. We have new people coming next month. We'll have a new policy committee, probably. New, you know, we shuffle things around, so we'll have to see. Um, but we try, I try not to have too many things coming over for a second reading for the first time with people who haven't seen it before. Um, so I am prepared to put the question to the board in January about whether or not the new members feel comfortable moving, having a vote on a second reading if they weren't sworn in for the first reading. I'm prepared for that. But I didn't want to wait on the Department of Justice or fire. So. Yeah, of course not. So, so next month, um, we're finally going to hit... Uh, or next month or February, depending on when everybody gets onboarded, because there's always that time of people getting sworn in, and then yeah. I don't know when the I don't know when the so the first meeting by policy, our our organizational meeting has to be the Tuesday after the swearing in, um, which let's see if I can pull up a calendar. I don't have January's Board of Ed calendar yet, do you? Yeah. That you don't think. So usually the swearing in is the first Sunday of January, which would be the 7th, which would put our organizational meeting the 9th. Jimmy saying yes from okay. the booth. Um, that would put our organizational meeting the 9th, which is when everybody puts in there, like you nominate the president and the clerk, and then you put your requests into the president, and then the president needs some time to look at all of those forms. Yeah. Or actually, because we have a new board, I don't think they would, like, that would be the night that they would get the forms to fill out, and then they'd need time to return them. So we yeah. might not even have a policy meeting in January. I just remember the first, the first night going, being like so overwhelmed, there was so much information, and it was so, um, yeah, it's kind of chaotic. Um, but I, but at the same time, it'd be kind of a shame not to have a policy meeting. It is, but if, especially where we, you know, if you just are just choosing your filling out the if you're just getting the form on the ninth, right, and then you need a few days to fill it out and return it, and then the president has to look at it, and then we have to come back and meet again because no one can serve on a committee until the until the board votes, yeah. that brings us to the 22nd. 
for a second to assign people to committees. So I think that, I don't think we can. Yeah, I still think we should have a meeting that day. I'm not in charge of that though, so. <laughs> Whoever's in charge can disagree with me. I'm not running for president, I can meet. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see what Ms. Kinsella has for us. Okay. Whoever's in charge. So I'm thinking February, at which time we have a really exciting policy on artificial intelligence that. Oh, it's going to come before us? Yes. You've been talking about it, so I've been looking forward to seeing it. And then I have a bunch of legislative updates. Sounds less fun. Actually, a lot of them are really interesting. Um, there's some about um, reviewing our non-public minutes. Um, like BEDG, that's a policy that gets updated like every single year. Oh, really? It's, oh, about, it's such a huge policy, too. It's about public comments and meeting minutes and all sorts of stuff. And so that one will be, you know, we have people who have very strong feelings about how minutes are done. So I'm sure that one will be a um, there's a new law on nursing mothers. Um, let's see, that one's interesting. There's a whole bunch of new stuff on data governance and facility plans. Um, there's a policy that I'm sure that um, the superintendent and um, Mr. Donovan would like us to hurry up and adopt because the law now lets um, the superintendent accept monies up to a certain amount without board approval. It like raises the amount and then it allows the board to accept a higher number without needing like a whole referendum, which is great for charitable gifts. Oh. Um, and then there's a lot of changes to restraint and seclusion um, that we are already following uh, a lot of the changes. Um, that were in law, we've, we've talked about it. I know that we've rolled out the changes, um, but we haven't updated the policy because we've been waiting for um, a form from the state. Okay. Um, uh, do we have that form yet? <sighs> I think there are other changes coming to that. Okay. Uh, there are. Of to the, the, to of the policy, the, yes. Of the 300. Uh, new bills that impact education, there are at least three that I was looking at this morning that are about restraint and seclusion. All right, that's a lot. Someone is proposing that that we videotape all restraint and seclusion, that before you make an intervention, you have to stop, bring out a recording device and start recording and then do your intervention while it's recording and not stop recording at any time until the intervention is. So, um, um, it would be nice if there were cameras in the seclusion rooms, but as far as the restraints and seclusions, like in the classroom, like when, when, a, when an event starts, I can understand why that wouldn't be recorded, but I would, it would be cool to see them in the seclusion room. How, what's going on with our kids and the actual interactions that take place there. So one of the, the changes to the law last year requires that kids not be left in there for more than 30 minutes. Like they have to have contact with an adult who's checking on them and providing an intervention every 30 minutes at a minimum. And I think that was a really important um, update to, to the law. I, I don't know, the, re the recording one is going to come before my committee, which is Child and Family Law, and I'm really interested to hear um, from experts in the field. Yeah. on how that could possibly work and how that interacts with other state laws that prohibit you from recording children and individuals without their express consent. Because yeah. we have anti-wiretapping laws that say you can't record people with audio without their permission. We'll probably have to get permission from the parents first, but... Um, but yeah, we'll have to see what happens. Right? <laughs> how do you get permission from the entire classroom's worth of parents to have videotapes of their kid in an unrelated incident. So I don't know. It'll be interesting. So um, that's all I've got. Anybody else? <laughs> I 
Okay. All right. So that's all I've got for tonight. Um, and I anticipate our meetings will be shorter. Okay. Makes me sad. I actually, I didn't want to go beyond policy at first, but I really like it a lot. So I hope that I'm still on it next year. Really? Policy is my favorite. Yeah, I do. I, I like it very much. <laughs> I know that policy is your favorite, Heather. I think everybody knows that. <laughs> Oh, all right. So I have nothing further. Do you have anything further? I do not. No, I'm just blathering at this point. Okay. So I move that we adjourn. Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 And it is 4.49 p.m. This is the shortest policy meeting we've ever had, and I made it stretch. <laughs>